Okay, uh, we're now in the 18th class of uh, Demystifying Revelation. And so we're now up to chapter 14, which is going to be about the Lamb, the 144,000, uh, three very distinct angels, and a very important harvest. Now, chapter 14 is the third chapter of a very important three-chapter parathetical section, which if if you recall, parenthetical chapters are like interludes; they're timeouts of uh, what the story has been so far, and then they go back and do a review. Uh, these three chapters in particular, they, they contain seven separate visions that, that, shall we say, add to the story, to the narrative. They do not follow the chronological timeline of the seals and trumpets and bowls, but instead, they serve to pause the narrative in order to give further development on what has happened, what is going on now, and maybe a preview of uh, upcoming event, which uh, all three are in these three chapters. So, since it's been a while since we've done chapters 12 and 13, let's go back and review it. Because if you recall, in chapter 12, chapter 12 introduced the woman. Uh, and that woman was Israel, and she was pregnant, and also introduced a great red dragon. And we were told that that dragon is Satan. Uh, but this red dragon had seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And then uh, we're told the dragon tries to kill um, the woman's male child. Quote, one who is to rule all the nations, but her child was caught up to God and his throne. And we know that that male child was Jesus Christ, right? And trying to kill her was with uh, uh, King Herod's decree of trying to kill all the uh, baby boys um, less than two years old. And then the woman uh, uh, flees to a place uh, in the wilderness because now the Satan is pursuing her. But she flees to a place in the wilderness prepared by God for 1,260 days. And that is, surprise, surprise, three and a half years. Verse 7 takes us to a war in heaven against Michael and his archangels, against Satan and his angels. And Satan and his angels lose, and they're permanently thrown down to earth. And now the Satan, the dragon, is enraged. And he once again, he goes after the woman. Um, and the woman is the Jewish people of Israel. And now, once again, the woman flees to the wilderness on eagle's wings, where she is taken care of for a time, times and half a time, out of the serpent's reach, which, by the way, is three and a half years. Verse 17, the, the dragon, Satan, he's now furious, and he goes after the rest of her offspring. Remember, uh, the male child of the woman is what? The seed of the woman. Well, what's the rest of her offspring? That's also the seed of the woman, which takes us all the way back to Genesis uh, 3.15. So now the dragon goes after the rest of her offspring, the rest of her seed. And these would be the Christians. Those, quote, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay, and that took us to Revelation 13, where now there's a beast. And once again, with ten horns and seven heads, and this beast is rising out of the sea, which would be the Sea of Gentiles. Uh, the dragon, remember the dragon, he's still there. Satan, he gives the beast his power, his throne, his authority. And then verse 3, one of the beast's heads, which is one of the Antichrist's kingdoms, seemed to have had a mortal wound, but was healed. And when we reviewed all that, we believe that to be uh, the revised Islamic caliphate um, from the Ottoman Empire. Verse 5, the beast was allowed to what? To exercise authority for 42 months. But the beast was allowed by who? by decree of God for 42 months. Well, this is now a third way of saying three and a half years. 
and verse 7 to make war on the saints okay and to conquer them oh that's disturbing and he was given authority over every tribe people language and nation so once again this is power that the beast was allowed he was given to him as what we read in uh, the first four seals of the apocalyptic horsemen the power was given to them Verse 8, all who dwell on earth, uh, that being not written in the book of life, will what? They will worship the beast. And we looked at the word worship, which is to, to uh, lay prostrate uh, before the beast. And we saw how that tied into um, Islam today. Verse 11, now we see another beast rising out of the earth. This would be the false prophet. And this false prophet, um, it had two horns like a lamb hmm interesting and spoke but spoke like a dragon so two horns like a lamb well what does satan do i mean he's not parading around as a devil uh as evil but he parades around as good at least good in the definition of the of the world second corinthians eleven fourteen says and no wonder for even satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds, which we will definitely see recorded in Revelation. So anyway, uh, we have this another beast uh, rising from the earth. Uh, it exercises all the authority of the first beast and he makes the earth worship the first beast it performs all sorts of great signs even calling fire down from heaven and tells people to make an image of the beast the first beast and it gives breath to the beast uh, and we start looking at modern technology and breath to the beast could be nothing more than a pa speaker and causes those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Verse 16, it forces everyone to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead in order to buy or sell. And we know that number was the number of men. Its number was 666. Okay, so that's a quick uh, review of chapters 12 and chapters 13 and now we'll start on chapter 14 14 verse 1 then i looked and behold on mount zion stood the lamb and with him a hundred and forty four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads and i heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the altars. So John looks and on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Now the question is, is, is this on earth or in heaven? Because uh, when we start really reviewing the context and as well uh, how might Mount Zion is portrayed in the Bible, uh, the possibility is both places. We read in Isaiah 59 verse 20 where it says, And a Redeemer, hmm, that would be the Lamb, right, will come to Zion, which we read in uh, Revelation 14 verse 1. To those in Jacob, that would be uh, Jacob's another name of Israel. And as we know, the 144,000 are from Israel who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And so this is just a perfect uh, fulfillment we're seeing uh, coming out of the prophet Isaiah. Paul said in Romans 11:26, and in this way, what? All Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. That's straight out of Isaiah. 
and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And then we read in Hebrews uh, 12.22, But you, you being the Lord Jesus Christ, have come to Mount Zion, okay, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festive gathering. Which is pretty much what all we're reading now in the first few verses of chapter 14. We also read that the 144,000 having been redeemed from earth, which is going to be the tail end of verse 3, uh, which is not on our screen yet. Hence, that this occurrence, it really involves both Mount Zions. So let's read on. Uh, so within the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. So let's that's, that's kind of explore this a little more. First of all, keep in mind Jacob's trouble and what Jacob's trouble was all about. It was about, it was about, um, it was about death, destruction, discipline, and redemption of a remnant that survives. In Zechariah 13, verse 7, uh, we have read in past, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. That would be Jesus Christ. Against the man who stands next to me, declares Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, uh, which happened uh, at the crucifixion, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. And then he says, In the whole land, declares Yahweh, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish. So in other words, two-thirds of the Jewish people will be killed as decreed by the Lord. This is the, this is a, the very sobering fact of Jacob's trouble. And only one-third shall be left alive. And then what happens? I will put this third into the fire. And refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. And then what happens after that? They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord Yahweh is my God. Let's also compare this to a very interesting vision given to Ezekiel. And the parallels here are um, staggering. Ezekiel 9, verse 3. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house, the house being the temple. And he called to the man clothed in linen. Now this is an angel who had the writing case at his waist. So this angel is like a recording secretary. And the Lord Yahweh said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of men who sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed in it. So in other words, there are those people, a remnant, that are still um, fervently love and worship and serve the Lord. And these are the ones that are being marked. And then in verse 5, And to the others, he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. This is going to be the two-thirds. Your eye shall not spare, and you shall, sh and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one to on whom is the mark. And begin where? At my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. And then he said to them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck the city, and while they were striking and I was left alone, I fell upon my face. I, as being Ezekiel, I fell upon my face and cried, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? 
And then he, the Lord, said to me, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. It's kind of like what we're seeing in the world today. For they say, the Lord Yahweh has forsaken the land. The Lord Yahweh does not see. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen with the writing case at his waist brought back words saying, I have done as you commanded me. So, let's kind of put all this together. And so here's, uh, after my research, this is the interpretation that I uh, see. When the end time saints, who are mostly Gentiles, or let's say Gentile Christians, are raptured, and the rapture, recall, is at the sound of the last trumpet, and we saw in Revelation, the last trumpet is what? The seventh trumpet. And then when we say rapture, we're also including all those dead in Christ that are resurrected as well. So the resurrection and the rapture. However, the non-Messianic Jews are still on earth. And so you have now a taking out of the Gentiles, which um, all this is fulfillment of Scripture. So let's look first at Romans 11, verse 25, where Paul says there's going to be a partial hardening that has come upon Israel. Okay. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay. And now that is now complete with the rapture because the fullness of Gentiles have now come in. They're now in the heavenly courts. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, what does he mean by all? That being the remnant, the one-third, as prophesied by the prophet Zechariah, and as we saw prophesied in Ezekiel. As it is written, huh, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, from Israel. And remember, Jacob's just another word for Israel. And this will be my covenant, my new covenant. This is the new covenant with them when I take away their sins. So after the saints, the true church, have been removed from earth, meaning they have been taken from the rapture straight to heaven, and that puts us squarely in the pre wrath rapture uh, so that's how i see the rapture jesus now turns his attention to those remaining on the ground his jewish people now this is going to be fulfillment of hebrews 9 28 and revelation 10 7 as well as romans eleven twenty five 25 uh, that we read above so let's look at those verses Hebrews 9, we'll start in verse 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, Christ being the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin. He's already done that by atonement on the cross, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And those eagerly waiting for him are the 144,000. I'm, I'm hoping plus more as they are a first fruit. But they're waiting for him as their Messiah and their king. So this passage says Jesus will appear, or the Christ, the Messiah, will appear a second time. Now this appearing is not the parousia in Greek but it is horeo, and that means to appear, to just to reveal oneself, so just to come. Um, and this is Christ appearing again to what? To fulfill Scripture. Remember, he says, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. 
so to refine as gold and silver to save the remnant nation of Israel as promised in the new covenant. Uh, Revelation 10, 7, which we had already read, um, in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, so that's when the church is raptured, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. And remember when we reviewed the mystery of God, this mystery um, most succinctly explained in Revelation, uh, correction, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. This mystery is that he, he being Jesus, might create in himself one new man in place of the two, that being Jew and Gentiles, Gentile Christians and Jewish believers, so that making peace and might reconcile us, Jew and Gentile, both to God in one body through the cross. This is the mystery of God that happens at the, during the sounding. Remember, the, the seventh trumpet is an ongoing trumpet during the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Okay. Now this... Uh, on Mount Zion stood the land with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And then what? I hear a sound. I hear a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And what? They're singing a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and before the elders. So let's explore this more. So they're singing a new song. So this is signifying to us that something new has happened, right? Because songs seem to be part of the ceremonies. So something new has happened. This is then evidently a formal event. And most likely, this is the end of the painful redemption of the remnant of Israel. The one-third that survives through Jacob's trouble as foretold by prophet Zechariah. And refresh our memories here in Zechariah 13, 8. And the whole land declares the Lord, Yahweh, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, The Lord Yahweh is my God, which is prophetic fulfillment of what we see in Revelation and prophetic fulfillment of what the new covenant is all about. This is a pro prophetic, painful redemption for the remnant of Israel. Um, Three other verses we'll look at. Hosea 5.15, where uh, God says, I will return again to my place. So that would be Mount Zion. Until they, they being the Jewish remnant, acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. And in their distress, they will earnestly seek me. He goes on in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Come. Let us return to the Lord, to Yahweh, for he has torn us so that what? He may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. In Hebrews 9, 28, which we already had read, but we'll review it one more time. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3. No one could learn the, that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these 
who have been who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And the, these have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Okay. So no one could learn this song except for this, these 144,000. Now the word here, learn, uh, mentheno, means... To learn by practice or experience, acquire a custom or habit, or, uh, like learning a song, but also to ascertain, to be informed, to understand and to comprehend. So to understand this song, not just learning the words, but to understand it, to really comprehend what the song is about. So maybe a better translation would could could be that none other than the 144,000 could understand or even relate to this song. Why? Because they're the ones that had to endure the severe discipline and refinement by their Messiah that they themselves have personally ex experienced. But they've been what? They've been redeemed. Agarazzo. Uh, and they've been redeemed pro uh, properly. Uh, Jesus Christ is what? He's purchased them. Um, and they've been redeemed. And not only redeemed, but they have now been reconciled with their Messiah. Now, Scripture, or John goes on to say, they have not defiled themselves with women. Well, um, that's not really in a literal sense. We're not saying they're celibate, uh, but spiritually they are. Because those that um, have turned away from God um, have spiritually committed adultery. And so what he's, he's a common saying here is that have not defiled themselves with women is another way of saying they have not committed spiritual adultery against God, against the bride of the as the bride of Christ. They must be faithful to their husband, Jesus. Uh, Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I promise to present you as a pure virgin in marriage to your one husband, the Messiah. Now, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God. That's a very encouraging word, first fruits, uh, parchi, uh, the first act of a sacrifice. Hence, the first fruits, the first portion, the firstling. Being first fruits means hopefully that there's much more for the harvest. So let's read on. What was this new song that they were singing? Well, there are some that believe it could be Psalms 118, and after I've read it, I believe the same. Because Psalms 118, is, it's a prophetic psalm. It speaks of severe discipline. Uh, and also, this prophetic psalm is sung by Israel during the last of the seven feasts of, of the given year, that being the Feast of Tabernacles on Mount Zion. So let's look at, at some excerpts from Psalms 118. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks... To the Lord, to Yahweh, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Verse 5, out of my distress, I called on the Lord Yahweh, and Yahweh answered me and set me free. It is better to take refuge in the Lord and Yahweh than to trust in princes, or let's say the world. All nations surround me. I was pushed hard so that I was falling. But the Lord Yahweh helped me. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And do you remember what the Hebrew word is for salvation? It is Yeshua. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. 
glad songs of salvation of Yeshua are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of Yahweh does violently. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of Yahweh. And then it goes on. Yahweh has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I might enter through them and give thanks to Yahweh, the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my Yeshua, my salvation. See how rich this is, especially now that we know what the name, Jesus' true name is and how that has been portrayed in the Old Testament. Yeshua, the stone that the builders rejected. That's Jesus Christ. That's Yeshua. He has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's, Yahweh's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, we read about that in what? Matthew 23, uh, where Jesus was confronting uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, before he was to uh, be sacrificed on the cross you know, with the seven woes. And he said what? He said, um, I will not return to Jerusalem until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So once again, this is a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew twenty-three thirty-nine. We bless you from the house, the temple of the Lord Yahweh. So it's a very, very rich song. So this new song, it's mostly, most likely it's a song of worship, it's a song of praise, it's a song of redemption, as well as a song of vindication. But extreme gratitude too, as well. A few verses later in, in uh, chapter 15 of Revelation, verse 3, we will see the song of Moses being sung. And is this the same song? Well, we'll explore this. But the song of Moses is, is, was sung, what? After Passover. Remember the ties of Passover that it has with Revelation and, and atonement um, uh, back, uh, uh, back then as well as on the cross. Because Jesus Christ was what? The Passover lamb and the crossing of the Red Sea. So let's read a little bit of this, Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, saying, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua, my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. Your right hand, O Lord, Yahweh, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You will bring them in and plant them on your earth own mountain interesting fulfillment we're seeing here mount zion is god's holy mountain the place O lord O yahweh which you have made for your abode the sanctuary O lord which is which your hands have established yahweh will remain reign forever and ever such a rich rich prophecy uh, of, about end times and, and like I've said it before but um, uh, you will never read the Old Testament again uh, the way you read it in past because because understanding revelation and uh, end times um, it will the Old Testament now will just explode with a brand new life so I'm going to stop part one there and uh, we will take up uh, with part two of um, this class in just a second.